Hello, this is a great pleasure to be here. Um, thank you to the organizers and did an amazing, amazing job. Yes, uh, talk about a, a topic that is very dear to my heart, um, and that is uh, on forests and climate change. Uh, but I'm also uh, work amongst uh, the top world scientists in the uh, University of Oxford, so I'm definitely here standing on the shoulders of giants, and I will be sure to uh, refer to them. Um, so I wanted to define a few terms. Uh, for one, forest, uh, not surprising <laughs> with the, uh, the definition that I was able to find, but I also, uh, it wasn't until I was a master's student that I was made aware of the fact that the actual historical term forest refers to uh, royal hunting grounds. And so it is actually not a definition based on the presence of trees, but on the exclusion of the riffraff, which I, uh, I'm glad that has changed because I, I do quite enjoy spending time in forests. <laughs> um, but also uh, this idea of frontiers um, and that frontiers are on the edge of settlement. Uh, in a way, large tracts of forests are by definition uh, along the frontier, especially if you ignore uh, cultures, very complex cultures that developed, um, sophisticated societies that developed in, within forests. But if you look at the history of, uh, take a historical spec perspective on historical co uh, forest cover, uh, in Europe over the last millennia, um, you have seen uh, the expansion of civilizations at the expense of forest. Forests were very useful for um, what the land was cleared uh, to expand agriculture, uh, trees were harvested um, for building ships, for building beautiful um, palaces. Uh, I will say a caveat that that's, that's obviously modeled. <laughs> we don't know exactly what the forest cover was at 1000 BC, but, um, but the idea is that it's, it's not surprising that uh, Europe was actually much more forested in the past than it is currently. And I'm trying to make the argument that forests in that way have always sort of been on our frontier of civilization. Um, which Tom so uh, eloquently described beforehand. But at this point in my talk, I should ad admit that um, my professional lens has been focused on the humid tropical forests, which I find to be um, breathtaking and beautiful. Um, so I, I may uh, submit you to, to photos of tropical forests, but a lot of what I'm discussing uh, is relevant to uh, globally, uh, forests across continents and across biomes. And this is a, a photo taken by my colleague, Greg Goldsmith, at, in Costa Rica. Um, and yes. But I, I, I want to, for the next few slides, I, I will uh, go through the, um, the various values um, that these forests, even at their distance from us, and even with not necessarily close proximity to us, um, provide to us globally. Um, and sometimes these are described as ecosystem services, but that's more of a, a, a term. And so among the most uh, charismatic uh, value of, of forests would be uh, habitat for biodiversity. Um, tropical forests on a per hectare basis uh, provide this at a, at a much, um, much higher rate than any other biome uh, in the world, but still. <laughs> but then um, rainfall capture is uh, another very important um, service to, to human society. Um, this can maintain water tables, it can prevent soil erosion, which leads to siltation of rivers and dams. Um, it can reduce the risk of flash flooding. And so in many parts of the world, we see uh, much higher rates of uh, flooding effects, not only because there's more rain falling, but also because we have um, maybe built uh, more houses on, on steep slopes or up above, uh, up on the tops of watersheds. But this captured water um, also provides another service, and which is used through photosynthesis. And I apologize for using um, some more equations, but just to, to illustrate my point, um, that uh, water is an important aspect of photosynthesis and is um, uh, actually recycled through trees um, from the water table to the atmosphere. And that becomes an important source of uh, cloud formation and rainfall. And so there are many parts of the world where they have documented that removal of large areas of forest actually leads to a net drying area, which has negative impacts on local communities. Uh, but also, photosynthesis is 
basically uh, what has created the biosphere as it exists today. Uh, if it wasn't for plants taking up carbon dioxide and releasing oxygen, we wouldn't have oxygen uh, dependent life. So um, that's an incredibly <laughs> important aspect of forests and how uh, some um, advocates have actually referred to large tracts of forest as essentially like the Amazon forest being equivalent to the lungs of the earth by helping us to provide, by providing oxygen. However, there's another um, service of photosynthesis, and that is as the carbon dioxide is taken away from the atmosphere, it's actually stored in plant tissue, in roots, in leaves, in stems, um, and that carbon storage uh, is, a, is a service because it's, again, it's carbon dioxide that's no longer in the atmosphere and warming the, um, the planet. And so this, uh, this can vary annually and seasonally, and, it, and it's referred to as um, net primary productivity. And this is uh, an animation um, that, that was created by World Mapper and uh, another uh, professor, Yuvinder Mali, at University of Oxford. And it's um, an interesting graphic because it will show you monthly estimates, uh, gridded estimates of, of primary productivity. You can see the, the tropics definitely dominate um, this image, and you, you see the temperate or the northern hemisphere disappear and come uh, reemerge during our summer and winter. And, uh, and I thought they had a, a beautiful way of describing that is actually the heartbeat, nature's heartbeat. So I'd, I prefer that one over the lungs of the planet. But unfortunately, uh, these beautiful areas are under threat, and primarily in many parts of the world is agricultural production um, that we are clearing them for, and even on that, the majority of that land is actually to produce, is not for uh, feeding humans, but is, is to feed livestock. Um, some other colleagues, University of Oxford, recently uh, made an estimate that if everyone in the planet uh, converted to plant-based diet, we would need 3.1 billion hectares less, fewer areas of agriculture, which I looked up is equivalent to 180 times the agricultural area of the UK. Um, I personally am not advocating that everyone become vegan. I know personally I would, I would have a difficult time doing that. But I do think it is important to be aware of the impact of our diet and if there are ways that we can reduce that impact. Um, but I also caveat that by saying that there is a limit to what individual behaviors can do and, and there is a collective action um, that needs to be taken. However, we know, um, to take a, a, a step back, uh, another aspect of the work I really enjoy doing um, is looking at uh, forests in space. And we've um, learned a lot on the, the scale of um, forests and the scale of deforestation. And so I'm, uh, this is actually an image, a, a fantastic study by Matt Hansen uh, from University of Maryland in collaboration with Google, where they did wall-to-wall um, -wall mapping of deforestation uh, from 2000 to the present day. And it's interesting to see the green areas are the um, remaining current area forest. The red areas are the forest that's been lost. The blue areas are the ones, are the areas where we've gained forest, and then a purple is a sort of a dynamic between loss and gain. Uh, and so from this image, you can see that tropical forests seem to be the most stable, um, a bit unfair to boreal forests, because they actually do have a, an important dynamic of fire. So they may look more degraded than they really are. But a, a reality that is acting on forests and all of us is that climate is changing, um, primarily driven by an increase, a dramatic increase in carbon dioxide emissions since the 1960s. Uh, there, you may have seen headlines recently that there's a, um, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change has stated that if we want to keep global climate change to within 1.5 degrees Celsius, we would have to essentially have all of our emissions by well, in the next 12 years, which is steep. Um, it's a steep call. And if you, if you look at that figure, uh, we're, at, we're at about one degree Celsius now. And um, some of those red lines do show an anomaly of up to 1.5 degrees already, but not steadily. Uh, I will say that those are average differences right, over, over, the, uh, over the globe. But in some cases, it can be much more extreme. In this past year, we saw 20 degrees warmer in the Arctic than normal. And um, I sincerely hope that is a freak accident, but 1.5 degrees does not mean that uh, universally around the planet. But 
I'm here to talk about forests. So the question is, how, how are forests responding to this change? Uh, and the short answer to that is differently in different places. I mean, that's sort of the catch-all. Um, this is a map of vegetation sensitivity. Uh, this was some scientists from University of Oxford, but led by um, Alistair Seddon uh, from the University of Bergen in Norway. And uh, it was a really interesting, this is also satellite-based, uh, looking at vegetation response and uh, climate forcing. And um, I'll spare you the details, but they do, uh, they, they managed to pick apart what they felt were the most, the, the strongest influences on vegetation uh, impacts. And so you have blue is the water, um, and that's quite dominant uh, across the planet. There are a lot of, there are a lot of areas that are water limited. Um, temperature, particularly active in the, again, the Arctic area where we've seen much more dramatic increases in temperature. Uh, and cloudiness, which is interesting, the, the tropics um, have a lot of clouds, not unlike here, and the um, sun is an important uh, ingredient for photosynthesis, so in theory, with less, fewer clouds, you could have more photosynthesis. But if we take, um, if we drill down and look at uh, the Amazon forest more specifically, it's, um, there's been quite a lot of work, a, a very uh, a massive army of, of scientists, and uh, so I will not take credit <laughs> for this. This is a, a paper that summarized essentially decades of monitoring for the forest, and, they, um, and these uh, two scientists, uh, Oliver Phillips and Roald Brennan, are from University of Leeds, and they uh, were intrigued by this idea of what was the carbon service, the carbon storage of the intact forest, of, of what they would call mature forest. Um, and they, uh, over these many decades of, of monitoring, they, they've seen that actually, rather than these mature forests actually being stable, this idea that they don't, they're not net sinks of carbon, that they don't grow, um, that actually there has been, um, and you can see on, on the left figure, uh, there's a bar chart showing essentially they average, or uh, they estimate 500 teragrams um, annually. Uh, and so to put that in perspective, um, one, uh, 500 teragrams is essentially half a gigaton. And half a gigaton, sorry, and, um, and annual fossil fuels in 2014 were roughly 9.8 gigatons. So not on the scale of annual emissions, but not insignificant when you consider the, the land area. Um, they, they also, so then to compare, to, to, to do that, equivalent comparison um, on the, the right side uh, is a, a map of the, um, all of the countries that the Amazon forest overlaps on. And it, um, and it shows you in green would be the, the carbon sink that that, that that area of Amazon forest in that country uh, has sequestered annually and compared to annual land cover emissions, so that would be from deforestation and um, national fossil fuel emissions. And they said um, they found that only Venezuela uh, was the only country where they, there was actually a net uh, emission of, of carbon from their fossil fuel sector, but that every other country, um, just from their intact forest, just from leaving their, their, um, their area of the Amazon uh, to go about its, its uh, business, um, was a net sink. However, um, going back to the, uh, this bar chart, you can see that that actual that, that, that sink is decreasing. Um, part of the reason the hypothesis around why there would be a net sink is that actually, again, a CO2 could be acting as a fertilization effect on these forests. And so with more, with more of their uh, food, so to speak, that they would be producing, um, they would be taking up more um, carbon. And so the question is, well, see, this, this bar chart is, is decreasing. And, uh, and so either are they, uh, the questions of whether it's a temperature effect or um, or the, the, we've maxed out the, the CO2 fertilization effect. And so this is work, um, this is a, a sort of a worrying trend, um, a worrying dynamic that's ha happening. Uh, my colleague Erica Berenger and um, at University of Oxford and Louis, uh, Luis Aragao from the Brazilian Space Agency at INPE have, done a, a, have been uh, documenting this, this sudden change in fire regime in areas of the Amazon that did not used to burn. Uh, and the the figure, I don't know if I can show, the, um, the upper figure on the left, uh, it shows you a very clear um, decrease in deforestation uh, of the Amazon over the last, it's 2002 to 2016. Um, but the lower one, the lower graph shows you incidence of fires. And there previously was quite a strong correlation between um, 
areas of deforestation and fire counts, especially in El Nino years, which is when these areas are dry and hotter. And this past season, in the last few years, they've seen a, a change in that, so that, that no longer is deforestation a predictor of fire, and that there seems to be other reasons, other factors that are impacting uh, the incidence of fire, which is very worrying in a, in a system that is not adapted to fire that can have um, massive impacts on tree mortality, uh, regeneration rates, and potentially this carbon sink that um, the Amazon has been providing us. So, to go back to the theme of frontiers, I'm not meaning to depress anyone, I think it is a very exciting, um, there are a lot of questions we have about the future of forests. Uh, and so I, um, what I present here on this slide is sort of a, um, a summary of a few, but there are many, many different techniques and many emerging ideas, but they, um, but they involve uh, more ground data to collect to monitor what's currently happening. Um, there's also uh, huge fields that look into the, the history of forest response and tree response, um, or landscape scale response of, um, you know, it, to look at, at past climate as a proxy for what we have currently. Uh, satellites, there are more satellites being um, uh, launched, it, it seems like, every few months. Uh, so there's an amazing constellation, and will be many more coming um, that should improve our understanding of what is happening. But we, you know, we still have to go from um, the very, the, the sub-individual tree, the, the leaf, the branch, to the tree level, to then how does that, um, how the population of trees interact at the community level, and, um, and then in the end, how, how will they be able to migrate or not, or um, we have massive, so many questions. So if anyone is interested to make a career out of uh, tropical forest ecology, you're welcome to come and join us. Um, but there's also, you know, if you're not interested in tropical forest ecology, um, there are other frontiers of collaboration, and, and this is um, a, a, a figure that my uh, colleague Cecile Jardin did at a, a recent conference we organized um, in, in Oxford on the topic of intact forests in the 21st century. And we, uh, she essentially, she and um, her, her colleague Lisa Curtis did a, 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 a pictorial um, summary of, of all of the pontificating the scientists and, and policymakers had done all day and, and did a really beautiful job of, of trying to capture uh, the scale of the problem and, and the number of actors that, that, are, that are involved. And um, forests are particularly interesting in that sense because they are um, uh, territories within, a, they're, they're uh, sovereign. They're, they're countries that are in, obviously know, know how to claim their forests. And so it, it's, they're a global good, but equally they're, they're a local resource. Um, and so it, it is exactly the interface of, of politics and economics and environment and indigenous rights and human rights. And um, so there's a lot, a lot of scope for uh, engagement by all sectors. And, and, I, and I would argue it's important <laughs> for everyone to be engaged with. So I, um, I thank you very much for the attention and for the opportunity to speak to all of you. Thank you, Alexandra. Now, as part of the tele...